Today, as we come to the table, as the lamps would burn, they had these bowls on top of each of these things filled with oil, pure oil, and in that oil, it would burn pure, and the light of that represented the light of the world. Matter of fact, they called it the light of the world. Jesus said, what? I'm the light of the world. He was saying, I am part of the tabernacle. I am even symbolized in the tabernacle. The very menorah that you look to as a nation symbolically, that's me. I'm the light of the world. I'm always watching the 12 tribes of Israel. I'm always watching over you. I'm that oil cross in the bread. I'm the blood sprinkled on the Ark of the Covenant. I'm the mercy seat. I'm the one you need to come to, you know. All you're thirsty, remember, come to me and drink. He says, that's me. I'm the light of the world. Jesus said again and again who he was. He's everything we need. He's the water when we're thirsty. He's the food when we're hungry. He's our shelter, our comfort. And he's the ultimate strength that's needed to do what he's called us to do. He's our guide, our protector. He's all things to us and more. Well, thanks for taking the time to join us as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Mark Kirk, senior pastor of Calvary Knoxville. In today's message, Pastor Mark will talk through the elements of the tabernacle, the place God established for the Israelites to worship. Each piece of table and lampstand and piece of furniture had a purpose and a deeper meaning. It's pointed to Jesus, to salvation that would come one day for all people. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Exodus chapter 25 for today's edition of Come to the Table. And you shall make two cherubim of gold. Of hammered work you shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end and the other cherub at the other end. And you shall make the cherubim at the two ends of it one piece with the mercy seat. So they were connected to the mercy seat and they were actually the wings together on the mercy seat. But they would be up there and they were facing each other. Here's the mercy seat, the lid on top of the ark. One angel facing this way with his wings going like this. Another angel facing this way with his wings going like this and the mercy seat underneath him, okay? Kind of got the picture in your mind? So the cherub that covered, there's the Lord, you know, on his throne, so to speak, all made of one piece. Verse 20, and the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and they shall face one another. The faces of the cherub shall be toward the mercy seat. So now, now remember, this is what it's going to look like in heaven, guys. You're going to see the angels with their wings spread over the Lord, under the Lord, the Lord sitting there. So you get a picture of what the throne is going to be like. So he's, he's really giving us insight here. And you shall put the mercy seat on the top of the ark. And in the ark, you shall put the testimony, that is God's word, the Ten Commandments that I will give you. And there, note this, verse 22, and there I will meet with you. And I will speak with you from above the mercy seat from between the two cherubim, the angels, which are on the ark of the testimony, and everything which I give you in commandment to the children of Israel. It is there I will meet with you. I love this. Why? Because when the high priest would go in to meet with the Lord, he had to sprinkle blood on it. He had to first make a sacrifice for himself, and then he had to go in and sprinkle blood on the ark of the covenant to atone for his sin and the sins of the people. And then after he atoned for his sins and the sins of the people, God would meet with him there by showing him mercy because his sins were forgiven and God would speak to him. Do you see the picture here, guys? See, now it's the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus has been sprinkled on us. He died on the cross. He has taken our sins away if we are his children. We are now clean. And when we go to meet with the Lord, God is merciful to us. And he speaks to us and he loves us and he ministers to us. Why? Because of the blood of his son that has washed our sin away. And now we have mercy. Don't you love mercy? I love mercy for everybody now. It wasn't always that way. I used to love mercy for me, but not you guys. <laughs> now that's before I was a believer. Don't get upset with me. 
I'm going way back. These are the BC days. Because if I'm driving in my car, and if you want you guys, somebody, I see some guy, you know, like this, going by me, you know? And then you see the woo, the lights, and I was like, that's what you get, man. That's what you get. Shouldn't have been doing that. You know better than that. But I'm driving, and the lights come up, woo, and I get pulled over. It's like, mercy, 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 mercy. You know? <laughs> Officer, you see, here's what happened, right? You know, we have our story or whatever, and you want mercy. Isn't it amazing how we want mercy for ourselves when the judgment's coming, but we're not as merciful for others? Part of growing as a believer is we begin to want mercy for others. Even now, as I get older in the Lord, I want mercy for the wicked. And that's a work of the Lord. You see people that are wicked, you say, you don't want mercy for them. But I'm starting to feel that now. That's exciting to me. Because I look and I say, you know what? Yeah, you're wicked, but we're talking about eternity and fire for you. And, and so you begin to have a compassion saying, I want you to repent. I want you to come around because I want you to be in the kingdom with me. I want you to have the same mercy I do. The only reason I have mercy is the blood. And now I can approach the mercy seat. Now I can approach the throne of God and have that grace. But I love it because God speaks to us now from that place of mercy because of what his son has done on the cross. And he says, uh, from between the two cherubim, which is the ark of the testimony above everything, which I will give you in the commandment to the children of Israel. Now, there's the ark of the testimony. That is in the Holy of Holies, the very last compartment. Now we come out into the compartment in front of the Holy of Holies. But now we're out in the area they call the, the most holy place. You have the Holy of Holies and the holy place, which is in front of that. And this is where we find the table of showbread and the gold lampstand, as well as the altar of incense, which we'll get to later. It's not in here, but let's just read this. The table for the showbread. You shall also make a table of acacia wood. Two cubits shall be its length, a cubit its width, and a cubit and a half its height. And you shall overlay it with pure gold. There it is again, because it's close to God, the royalty. And make a molding of gold all around. You shall make for it a frame of a hand breadth all around. And you shall make a gold molding for the frame all around. And you shall make for it four rings of gold and put the rings on the four corners that are in the four legs. So it, all of these implements had rings on them uh, where you could slide a pole through them and the priest could carry them. So this has rings as well. The rings shall be close to the frame as holders for the poles to bear the table. And you shall make the poles of acacia wood, overlay them with gold that the table may be carried with them. You shall make its dishes, pans, pitchers, bowls, its pouring, uh, for pouring rather. You shall make them of pure gold Again, these things, as you're working in, there had to be kingly. They're, they're close to the throne of God. So the gold has to be there. You shall set the showbread on the table before me always. Now, again, what's cool about this? Here's how the showbread worked. And what is showbread? They would take that table we just read about, had the poles in it. It was in this front room. And they'd make 12 loaves of bread every week. And each week you'd put the 12 loaves of bread in. And each week you'd replace the 12 loaves of bread. Now, the 12 loaves of bread represented what? the tribes of Israel. Each one represented the tribe of Israel. And in this place, we'll see when we get to the lampstand, which represents the eyes of the Lord, the view of the Lord, the uh, God all seeing all things. It was always in the holy place, which was showing the children of Israel, my eyes are always on you. Isn't that great? Always. I always see you. My eyes are always on you. So guys, understand this. Even as God gave that representation to the children of Israel, he gives us the same representation tonight. God's eyes are always on us. We are now in that holy place. Not that this building is holy, it's just a building. But we're drawing into the Lord. Do you feel it happening? As we study his word and begin to see his glory in this, he by his spirit is drawing us in. So his eyes are upon us. Now here's what's cool about this bread. And by the way, this is the bread when nobody was to eat this bread but the priest. But remember when David came and he was running from Saul, he asked for some of the showbread. They had taken some out that was a week old and put some new in there. The priests were allowed to eat it. But in mercy, they gave it to David because he was on the run. And of course, he had told them he was doing a, an errand for Saul, which he wasn't. But anyway, that's the same showbread. But what's neat about the showbread is, and they're already making plans. You know, those that have been to Israel, some of you in here have, you've seen the table of showbread. You've seen the things where they're going to rack the loaves of bread on there to represent the 12 tribes of Israel always before the eyes of the Lord. But this is what's cool to me because there's certain things that the Jews do that they don't know why. This is one of them. Every loaf of bread has to have a cross with a finger put on it in oil. A cross in oil. And then they put their bread in place. A cross in oil. And then they put their bread in place. They have no clue what that means, and they wouldn't admit it if you suggested it. But guys, we see that we're always before the Lord, and it's the cross that makes us before the Lord. It's the cross that gives us that connection to God. It's the cross that makes us in his cross hairs in a good way, so to speak, you know, where he can see us. It's the oil of the Spirit working in our lives. And this whole picture of just the Lord 
and his goodness and watching us and watching over us. I love it. So this is what's happening with the table of showbread. And he says, you shall set it before me always because his eyes will always be on them and his eyes will always be on us, he says in his word as well. So the, the whole picture transfers over to us. Now we come to the golden lampstand. But notice he says, you shall also make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand shall be of hammered work. Its shaft, its branches, its bowls, its ornaments, its knobs, and its flowers shall be of one piece. Now, this is the menorah. It was that seven branch. It represents the seven days of creation. It represents the completeness of the Lord. And as the lamps would burn, they had these bowls on top of each of these things filled with oil, pure oil. And in that oil, it would burn pure. And the light of that represented the light of the world. Matter of fact, they called it the light of the world. Jesus said, what? I'm the light of the world. He was saying, I am part of the tabernacle. I am even symbolized in the tabernacle. The very menorah that you look to as a nation symbolically, that's me. I'm the light of the world. I'm always watching the 12 tribes of Israel. I'm always watching over you. I'm that oil cross in the bread. I'm the blood sprinkled on the Ark of the Covenant. I'm the mercy seat. I'm the one you need to come to, you know. All your thirsty, remember, come to me and drink. He says, that's me. I'm the light of the world. And so this represented the light of God seeing the nation seeing us and all these different things that God did in here. And now they're making, it has to be a one piece of gold. And by the way, they've now made one in Israel. Again, if you've been to Israel, you've seen this. If I'm not mistaken, I think it was $6 million worth of gold. Does anybody remember? I don't, I don't quote me on that. But it seems something like $6 million worth of gold to make this thing. But whatever it was, it's a lot. And it's huge. It's like, maybe the reason I'm thinking six is because of its height. So forget the amount, but it's a lot. I know it's millions. Let's go there. I'll be safe. I'm on tape. <laughs> Pastor Mark didn't tell the truth. But it's like six feet tall and like six feet wide or so. This thing's massive. They've already got it made. They've got it made for the third temple. They've got all these things that we're reading about made, ready to go for the third temple because the Bible says in the last day it will be rebuilt. We know that it will. But I wanted you to picture in your mind what it was as we read this because it's hard to understand if you don't have a visual. Look at 32. And six branches shall come out of its sides. So that is three on each side, three branches out of the lampstand on one side and three branches of the lampstand on the other side. Three bowls shall be made like almond blossoms on one branch with an ornamental knob and a flower and three bowls made like the almond blossoms on the other branch with an ornamental knob and a flower and so for all of them in other words. And on the lampstand itself there'll be four bowls shall be made like almond blossoms each with its ornamental knob so four of them will be that way and there shall be a knob under the first two branches of the same and a knob under the second two branches. Now, there's going to be a total of of seven branches. I mean, the main branch and then three on each side. So when he says four here and one like that, he just means they're going to look a little different. But you see, it's still just the seven. Verse 35, there shall be a knob under the first two branches of the same, a knob under the second two branches of the same, and a knob under the third two branches of the same, according to the six branches that extend from the lampstand. Their knobs and their branches shall be of one piece, and all of it shall be one hammered piece of pure gold, And you shall make seven lamps for it, and they shall arrange its lamps so that they give the light in front of it. So there'd be these backing to it, and the light would go out toward the front. Again, they would have these pure wicks that they would have to trim, and fresh oil they would put in them so they'd always burn pure, so to speak. And again, that gives a picture of, uh, well, let's just read this. Verse 37, you shall make seven lamps for it, and they shall arrange the lamps so the light comes to the front. And its wick trimmers and the trays shall be of pure gold as well. Again, he's not going to give the detail I was going to tell you, so I'll tell you. But their job as the priest was to keep those things trimmed so they burn pure and they burn bright. And God as our high priest also is responsible to do that in us. Isn't that cool? Now, I know we can dull the light. I know we can become all crusty and and not have that fresh oil because we're not spending time in prayer and maybe not burn brightly because we're kind of getting lax and lazy and we're not really seeking the Lord and drawing near to Him in that holy of holies. But God is gracious to bring along the things that drive us back to it, isn't he? (laughs) I've had my wick trimmed quite a few times. And I can tell you, it's not always fun to get your wick trimmed. I don't like it. But when it happens, I notice a difference. And I know you do too. You burn brighter because there's a purity there. God cuts away the crusty edges and he says, now you're burning pure for me. This is where I needed you, you know, to be burning. So, The wick trimmers, their trays of pure gold as well. It shall be of one talent of pure gold with all these utensils and and see to it that you make them according to the pattern. Here's again, it's got to be like the one I'm showing you, according to the pattern which was shown on 
the mountain. Now, there was one other article we'll get to later that was in there, the altar of incense, and it was of pure gold as well. It sat right outside the curtain where on the other side was the mercy seat. And the priests would go in there. Only the high priest alone could go in the Holy of Holies where the ark was. But the other priests could go in and they would sprinkle, they'd put hot coals on the altar and then they sprinkled a special incense on it and it, was, it represented the prayers of the nation going up before God. So there's the mercy seat. There's the prayers of the nation going up. Here's the light of the world. Here's the menorah. Here's God's all-seeingness, if you will, in the menorah. Here's the table of showbread representing the 12 tribes of Israel with the cross in oil on it. And the presence of the Lord was palpable. You think about the priest going in there, and, and I think as a priest to get in there and to see all this representation and feel that closeness to the Lord, how exciting that would have been, and the desire to go beyond that curtain. Guys, we have the ability now to go because the curtain's been torn in two. Is that cool or what? They longed to be able to go back there, just to be able to see the mercy seat, to be in the presence of God. We get to do that on a regular basis, and we get to do that tonight. You know, when you think about the picture of the tabernacle in your mind, there's this whole, the Temple Mount was huge, 40 acres. And when people would come in the celebrations and the feast, they would crowd up on the Temple Mount as many as 100,000 people on the Temple Mount at that time. That's a UT football game. So take UT Stadium, move it onto the Temple Mount, that's how many people would be there. Pretty much anybody could go there. You were allowed to go in that. Imagine it like going to church. There's church. There's a massive courtyard in the church. Everybody gets to go in. It's packed. If you wanted to stay just there, you could. You could. You could just kind of, you know, stay on the outskirts. And yet you're around the people of God. That's fun. But you're not really drawing close, you see? You're kind of out there and not really in. Then for those who wanted to go a little bit deeper, then they would go into the court of the Gentile area, which really was that still main big area. But you could draw closer to the temple area, if you will, and you're yearning to be closer to God. See, the, they had what they called God-fearers among the Gentiles, and they couldn't go in the service, but they could stand there behind this barrier wall, and they could listen. And they yearned to be close to God. They yearned to be, they just didn't want to become a Jew. They didn't want to be circumcised and follow the law and do all that, but they still felt like they could know God, and they could, but you couldn't be a part of Judaism without doing that. These were the ones that really loved Paul. When he showed up to the synagogue, the God-fearers were excited because they realized, wait a minute, we're Gentiles and we can, without following the law, we can know the Lord, yeah. So you draw in closer by getting there. Then you would go into the court of the women. And of course, the men would enter there too. As you go farther back into the church or the tabernacle, and now you're even closer to God. You know, Somewhere you know the presence of the Lord is really powerful back there, right? And so you go in closer, and if you wanted to, you could stop where the God fears did, or you could stop in the court of the women and say, you know what, that's good enough for me. Then there was the court of the men. You go a little deeper back into the court of the men, and you could be there and have that closeness to God. But then there was that place you couldn't go, only the priest could go. And that's where, again, the sacrifices were made. The altar was there and all the implements right outside of the temple. Then you went into the holy place, which we just read about where all these articles are except the Ark of the Covenant, the showbread and the altar of incense and the, the menorah and all that, they were in there. And then behind the veil, of course, came the Ark of the Covenant. Now, why do I say all this? Guys, look, you can go as far back into the tabernacle as you want to go tonight. It's up to you. You can stay in the outskirts with the crowd. This is fine. I like going to church. It's all right. It's good. And then they have, you know, cookouts every so often and you meet nice people. I like this. And that's all you're going to get out of it. Then you can advance on into one of the deeper court areas. And yeah, you can get a little bit closer and get some more involvement. Maybe know people a little bit more and feel a little bit more religious maybe. And I'm doing a little bit more better. I'm doing better than I was last year. You know, last year I was out in the courtyard area. Now this year I'm actually you know, into the court of the women, the court of the men. I'm kind of getting closer. Or you can draw on in to the court of the men and the inner circle there, so to speak. And of course, only the priest could go where the priest could go where the sacrificial area was. But that represents everyone now because the Bible says in Revelation chapter 1 that we are all what? Priests, kings and priests to God, which means now we can go even closer and drawing closer to the Lord if we desire to. And then we can also go, if we want even more, we can go into the holy place, the most holy place where the menorah was and the table of showbread and the altar of incense where God's eyes were on them and the 12 tribes were represented and the prayers were going up to God, spending time in prayer, seeking the Lord. You see in the outer area of the sacrifices and you begin to make those sacrifices of praise and, and, and sacrifices to the Lord and giving your life to him. You see how this works? 
And as you get farther back in there, now you give more and more sacrifice. And it becomes a place where you're closer and closer to the Lord. And then you come finally to the veil, which now for us has been torn in two. And you can actually enter into the holiest of holies, into the closeness and intimacy and presence of the Lord. Here's my challenge to us tonight. Which one are you guys? Are you fine out here? Eh, I'm doing okay. I'm going to go to heaven. But that's all. I'm not getting any more serious about it. You know, I got other stuff I got to do. Busy life. And then you got those that are kind of right in the middle. They're like right there and they, they want more than just on the outskirts and they're in closer and they're, they're in the worship and they're seeing this, but it, it's enough. This is good enough. I go to church and, and, and you know, every so often, you know, uh, so uh, love you, Lord. And I say a few words in worship. I do that. And then you've got those who go on back to sacrifice. They go beyond that place where the, where the sacrificial altar is. And they say, Lord, I don't care what I feel like. I'm giving you a sacrifice of praise. I'm going to worship you, God. I'm going to lift up your name because you're worthy. No, I feel terrible, but you're worthy. So, Lord, I'm going to worship you. And you enter into that sacrifice. What's a sacrifice? It wouldn't be a sacrifice if it wasn't a sacrifice. Oh, certainly we want to rejoice when we praise the Lord. But sometimes, you ever been in the sacrificial mode of worship? I have. I don't like it, but I'm going to admit to you as a pastor, sometimes I come in and say, but this is the, I, I need to be here. I need to be sacred. I need to be drawing closer. I want to go deeper in the tabernacle. I don't want to be on the outskirts any longer. And I want to get here and I want to worship. And here I go. And then God begins to draw you in. And I've learned that the older I get in the Lord, no matter how the worship is, I can still worship. Quite honestly, when I was younger in the Lord, if the worship was terrible, I was like, the worship's terrible. You, know, you, you don't want to really complain, but you're like, I can't, I'm having trouble here. But I've found in certain situations, if I go and maybe the worship is not that great, I can make a choice. I'm going to worship God. And I do. And I think that's part of growing and part of being mature. But then beyond the sacrifice, we enter into that place where the sweetness of the Lord is. Once we make that sacrifice, there's that light of the Lord shining on us from the menorah of the Lord. There's the bread of God where we're eating the word of God. We're getting fed, you know, and God's eyes are on us. There's that altar of incense where we begin to pray and just thank the Lord. And this sweet kind of, you know, relationship that's going up to the Lord. And then there's that where we just draw close to God and we're right there at the mercy seat. So that's what I want us to ask ourselves. Where are we tonight? On that scale, we're probably somewhere in that scale, all of us. The question is, where do you want to be in that scale? I want to encourage you and invite you to draw in. Draw in. As we worship tonight and get ready for communion, as we're worshiping, draw in. I don't get into visualizations, but you might want to picture yourself. Where am I? Just be honest with you and God. Don't you have to tell anybody. So are you in the court? Yeah, me too. Where are you? I'm in the court of the women. I'm in the court of the men. You know, man, I'm at the sacrificial altar. You're righteous. I'm not talking about that. Ask God where you are. Where am I, God? Am I really involved? Am I pressed in? Or am I just kind of here? And then begin to ask God to draw you in. Say, God, I want to see your glory at your seat of mercy. I need mercy. I need it. And I want to see your glory. And I want to experience your mercy. And I want to get close to you, Lord. And I want to have that, the sweetness of your, you know, the prayers going up and just all that goes with that. So ask yourself where you are in that process. Ask God to draw you into that process. And tonight as we have communion, let's enter into the holiest of holies. Let's have true communion with the Lord. And just like that, another time at the table of God's Word has come to an end. Maybe you've heard these things mentioned in the book of Exodus before, or perhaps you're hearing it for the first time. Exodus is one of those books where it's undeniable, observing God's power and might in what He does through His people and for His people. Pastor Mark will continue teaching through the book of Exodus next time, but you don't have to wait until then to listen to more great Bible studies. You can access this series, plus much more, at thewaymedia.net. Feel free to share these messages with anyone who wants to know more about what the Bible has to say. You can also download the Way Media app to access teachings as they're available. Before we close, we want you to know that if you live in the Knoxville area, you're invited to join Pastor Mark in the community of Jesus followers at Calvary Knoxville for our next service. For over 20 years, it's been incredible to see how God has used us in our local community. And through this radio outreach, there's always a seat for you. Sunday mornings at 8, 9.30, or 11.15. We also meet on Sunday nights at 6 or Wednesday nights at 7. 
If you can't make it in person, that's not a problem. You can join us online. We're streaming our services through the Way Media app. To find more info on Calvary Knoxville, scroll to the bottom of the waymedia.net for a link to our church website. Pastor Mark has more to share from the book of Exodus, so be sure to join us the next time we come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.